Well, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, welcome to the fourth night of our Plenary Tracker, an online forum following the progress of the Australian Catholic Church's second assembly of the historic Plenary Council. We're bringing you news and insights from the Council from Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn with the support of the Australian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Garrett Publishing. I'm Genevieve Jacobs. I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and I acknowledge their enduring ownership of this place, their elders past, present and emerging, and all the traditional owners of the places whence each of you joins us. Every night you'll hear from Plenary Council members, insiders, observers, others to discuss the day's events as the Council votes on issues central to the life of the Catholic Church in Australia. That's become an increasingly intense space over the past few days, as you'll hear this evening. The purpose of this tracker is very much to engage with ordinary concerned Catholics as we build a more humble, transparent and inclusive church. So as the conversation unfolds, please do use the Q&A function on your screens to send us questions right through the discussion. We'll get to those questions around about eight o'clock. I don't promise that we'll get to them all or in the exact form that they're posed, but we will do our best to cover a diverse range of queries. So please keep your questions courteous, direct, bearing in mind that other listeners may have many different beliefs. This is not a space for disparaging those, despite the powerful feelings that are sometimes attached to these issues. James McEwen is our technical administrator. Please message him through the Q&A if you're experiencing any difficulties. This edition of the tracker runs for around about 45 minutes. If you're keen to have a look for yourselves at the motions and amendments, you can find them on the Plenary Council's website at plenarycouncil, or one word, .catholic.org.au. And you can also support this webinar series and all the work of Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn via the front page of the Concerned Catholics website. But now the news and a day filled with news. An extraordinary protest by women delegates today has forced a rethink by the bishops who late yesterday refused to support motions enhancing the role of women in the church, including the possibility of being ordained as deacons. Women delegates gathered at the back of the meeting room and refused to participate in the afternoon session after the bishops had left the plenary without any significant response to the overwhelming consensus in the earlier submissions and in the rejected motions for the dignity and the equality of women in the church to be recognized and actioned. Plenary Vice President, Bishop Shane McKinley proposed more time for reflections on the outcomes the two failed motions, in fact, received a majority of the consultative and deliberative votes, and more explanation on that in just a moment, but not the two thirds majority required under the rules. The assembly decided to allow the bishops a further deliberative vote on revised motions, which will be considered later in the week. In a statement, the chair of Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn, John Warhurst, said it was some bishops refusal to consider the creation of women deacons should Pope Francis authorise such a ministry that was so disheartening. Francis Sullivan, who headed the church's dealings with the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse, said the attitude to gender diversity and to the role of women is indicative of the cultural misalignment of the church with contemporary Australia. A reminder that your questions can go into the Q&A at any time. Our topics tonight for discussion are liturgical, spiritual and sacramental life from the Council's agenda. But let's hear first from Dr Mark Copland, who's joining me as a Plenary Council member. In a moment, we'll hear from Sister Claire Condon from the Good Samaritans and Professor Mary Collo from the Presentation Sisters and the Yarra Theological Union. Mark Copland has lived and worked the majority of his life in remote and regional Australia. He's currently the mission executive for St. Vincent's Hospital at Toowoomba. He was the inaugural executive officer of the Social Justice Commission for the Catholic Diocese of Toowoomba and spent 16 years in this role. Mark, welcome. An enormous day of confusion, distress, some drama, perhaps room for a little optimism at the end. But I do want to go first to a question we didn't reach last night from our audience, but that's really important for clarity. Very briefly, can you talk me through how this voting process on the motions works? Because I think this goes to a fair degree to the mess things appear to have got into. So just take us through what happens when a motion goes up. Okay. Um, good evening from Gadigal Country, uh, Genevieve. Um, so each uh, day there, there's a set 
um, number of um, motions. And um, if there are amendments to those motions, all of the uh, members of the council, including the bishops, uh, vote on those amendments. Then when the motion itself is to be considered, just the consultative um, voters, so the non-bishops, they vote on that. And then the following morning, uh, the, the uh, deliberative vote is taken by the bishops. So they will decide in the morning. So the vote you're talking about, uh, where, where the um, equality and the dignity of uh, women and men, uh, that, that vote was that took place this morning, uh, just before morning tea. Yes, and, and so today we've had that result on the motions involving women, and it was, well, it was shocking. I can't gild that, Lily. Take us yeah. through what happened when the bishops' yeah. votes were um, Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I, I guess there was, there was um, real, um, yeah, there was shock, there was gasps in the room, um, there was um, enormous pain, there were a lot of um, immediate tears. Um, and so that kind of happened just before morning tea. And then um, it's NAIDOC week this week, and the theme is uh, get up, stand up, show up. And that kind of happened pretty much. And, um, yeah, I was really proud. There were, there were men uh, as well, and I was really proud to stand with some extraordinary uh, women uh, who just said, we, we, this can't wash and we can't move on. You've got to go back and look at that again, um, and so and so yeah. Th there was and one one of the um, I heard two phrases. One said, "This is like a mutinous parish council on steroids." That was one <laughs> phrase I heard, and um, and an, and another one is that this is a disruptor. Um, yeah. So so the, yeah, it was a it was a very powerful moment. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of pain, a lot of pain. Um, and yet the day was a bit like a roller coaster because um, the groups went away and met um, over lunch, and there is a willingness um, across, you know, across different groups. There's a willingness to come back and, and let's 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 look at this again. So, yeah, there is a bit of hope at the end of the day, and I, I have that hope. Was there any accounting? For what happened, will the council look again at yesterday's motions? We, we just heard that there's perhaps some more time being given to this. I mean, is there a way through this, given the, the shock, the distress that's that's emerged from this, and particularly from the consultative process as a whole, from which these, these notions about the dignity of women and men and, and women's right to leadership emerge from? Yeah, and that's, well. and that's the tough part when you have more than two thirds so that we need to, um, yeah, the motion needed to pass. Um, so there has been time already uh, where uh, groups have looked at ways in which we can um, look again at, at the motion. Um, and then that will be um, later in the week, we're going to revisit that. So um, we will see what the, the um, all of those submissions, what the drafters come back with and what we'll see how people, how that lands. Yep. And Mark, I do have a question on the screen from Chris who says, if you could just explain briefly what those motions were, uh, very concisely, what, what those decisions three women were that were, were lost. Um, yeah, of the one of the most, most broadly, it was to, to um, acknowledge um, the role of women uh, within the church historically and, and present. Um, and also, uh, if um, there's a new commission looking at, at possibly a, a diaconate for women. And so if that was to, to pass, then, then um, for us as an Australian church uh, to look at that. Um, and, and then the, another one was to look at um, women in, in governance roles, in decision-making roles, um, that, that, that there might be some prominence uh, for that in, in the church. So that they were... Um, but these come, as you know, from, you know, thousands of, of submissions um, and, and they are qu quite modest, quite modest. And, and a, number, a number of people probably felt, well, yeah, felt they could have gone far further. So uh, um, they've been well-researched. Uh, we have fantastic um, 
we, I know we've got Claire Condon with us, but we had great experts uh, give input and that's happened all along the way too. Yeah. And, and look, I have a, a question from someone who says, how can we redraft motions when we don't know why the bishops dissented? Uh, Beth has commented after watching and praying along with the first hour of prayer and contemplation, I felt so sad for the distress, distress we had of Claire Victory, who was with us last night, who was just palpably quite devastated by yesterday's discussions. Beth wonders whether the plenary council has seriously been listening to the spirit during the day. Jacinta says, so proud of the women present who stood up and protested and for the men who stood with them. Uh, Mark, the fo focus on the motions today was liturgical, spiritual and sacramental life. Was this debate less divisive? Well, well, Genevieve, it wasn't um, because we didn't get there. Didn't get to it. <laughs> no. Um, so this, the subs, the, the day stopped, uh, and and in, and in one sense, I do give credit um, to uh, you know to the steering committee um, and those organising that that we didn't just bowl on, and I don't think we could have. I, I don't think that there's no way uh, we could have. Um, yeah, so that that that's what that's what happened. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's a fair question. Where we uh, are we listening? Well, indeed, and uh, and and look, a lot of comments coming in on that. Really questioning um, whether whether anyone is is listening and paying attention. Mark, you've worked and you've been part of the diocese of Toowoomba for more than more than twenty years, and of course, you went through the pain and turmoil with the forced retirement of Bishop Bill Morris. A lot of the things discussed at the Plenary Council, the, the Third Rite of Reconciliation, the role of lay men and women, the future of the ordained clergy were raised by Bill Morris. All these years later, where do you see those issues within your own diocese, within the framework of, of the council? Oh, definitely. I think I think Bishop Bill was um, prophetic. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, today shows that, that those issues are very real. Um, a couple of... Uh, for me personally, some of the most moving sharing is with rural women. Um, and, and a couple have shared that this is already happening, you know, in, in remote areas, there are women leading parishes, there are no ordained uh, clergy there, um, you know, they're, they're running the parish council, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're doing everything. So, yeah, it's almost, I, I guess the pain is why is that seen as second best? Um, yeah. Mark, I, I grew up in Western New South Wales. This is the story of my whole childhood, tiny little wooden churches in the bush being completely kept afloat by faithful women. Uh, Andrew's commented, I submit as follows, the Catholic Church is defined as the body of Christ, not the institutional church. We, the body of Christ, are united by our faith in positive spiritual values, such as humility, compassion, and fairness that Jesus exhibited in his life, his death and resurrection not dogmatic beliefs that exclude people. Look, I, I want to bring in um, our panel guests now. And, and look, a reminder about the, the Q&A function. Questions can go in at every stage. That gives us a chance to see them and work through them. Uh, Sister Claire Condon, SGS, was the leader of the Good Samaritans of the Order of St. Benedict between 2005 and 2017. And during her leadership, she supported the sisters' important humanitarian work in Australia, the Pacific and Southeast Asia. She was also president of Catholic Religious Australia between 2008 and 2010. And in 2013, she was awarded the Australian Human Rights Commission's Human Rights Medal. And Professor Mary Collow is with us too from the Yarra Theological Union. She's a presentation sister with a doctorate in theology and is a professor within the University of Divinity. For seven years, she worked on a dialogue for, Pontifical, for the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity. Uh, Claire Condon, I just want to also go to you first to ground people in the process. You're a peritus. What, what does that mean? It means we're advisors. Um, the word ex really means expert, but I don't think any of us are an expert on anything in particular. You know, we all bring our gifts. But we're there to advise and, and probably we've had limited interaction with the members until this, this assembly. And so in this assembly, we've been asked to present a five minute um, presentation before each of six of the eight themes. And so we did that yesterday um, for three and four and today for five and six, but because of the response to four and the, the witnessing to the uh, equal dignity of women and men, 
Uh, I'm not sure what will happen to the, the five and six, whether they need to do that again to remind people. But also I think today highlighted the need for more theological input and understanding amongst the members. And I, th I think that's highlighted some deficiencies in the process up to this point. But at, at the lunchtime break today, a number of the members gathered uh, with some of the parity to, um, to tease things through. And I know one of our members has been appointed to, the, to a new drafting committee to take that section. Um, there were, the, the members spent a lot of time on it today. And I think it reinforced for me a hope because I think there was real discernment followed that rejection. And I think the rest of the day was spent in that, um, in that reflection and that discernment. And each of the tables was invited to present what would improve the motions. And that will be dealt with by a writing group tomorrow and brought back on Friday to the group. So I, I do give credit to the steering committee that saw, I think was surprised. Some of them might've been surprised, but realized they could not go forward. Uh, and this is, a, this is a key issue for the church, whether or not um, we believe in Vatican II and the kind of church it's calling for, or whether we belong to a restorations group. And that's, that's the tension that's there. It's pulling either way. Um, so okay, you've just mentioned the lack, perhaps, of you know, theological foundation for some of this thinking. And, and I just want you to talk to me about the paper you presented yesterday that addressed directly the relationship that Jesus and the early church had with women. I will, but I know Mary could probably do it better. No, no, As I'll I go to Mary in just a moment <laughs> because I know this had a powerful impact on the council. So, so talk to us about this. Well, I think that's if we want to be faithful to a Christ-centered church, we've got to go to the New Testament. It's got to be our starting point. And Jesus' relationship with women um, and then the Acts of the Apostles and the relationship within the early Christian church mm -hmm. is one of cl clarity about Jesus' relationship with both men and women. And I think that's been lost in the church. Mm -hmm. And I think our scripture scholars, our theologians and experts in these areas have really restored and brought that back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's got to be our basis. It's got to be our foundation. And, um, and so I think that's, that's key to where we go. Mary Colo, a brief comment from you first on the spirit that's at play in the council. We've had some questions about this from members of our audience saying, are we genuinely listening to the spirit mm -hmm. if so much that's powerfully felt can be pushed aside? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Genevieve. I spent a bit of today really reflecting on what we mean by discernment. Mm -hmm. And that was in response to uh, the plenary track of Monday night and Tuesday night to the blogs I was reading. Monday night, the plenary tracker, there was a great sense of hope, of communion and joy, an overcoming of divisions in affirming the voice of the First Nation people. The blogs were similar. Last night was a different experience. Last night, there was heavy sadness, pain, a sense of division, a sense of exclusion rather than inclusion, and even fear. Now, it, these, these need to be what people are trying to discern. Where is the spirit in these movements? Um, look at Paul, what Paul says in Galatians 5 when he describes, you know, what, what the spirit brings. And listening to what happened today, so I'm not a member of the council, listening to what happened today, I think sometimes it's only when a decision's made, the reaction, 
and it's in the reaction it becomes clear what the inner movements were really saying. If members of the plenary council can now discern more clearly that what the voting that happened was not coming from the spirit, but from a place of fear, then the, those decisions need to be revisited, rescinded, relooked at. And uh, that's not an uncommon thing to happen in discernment, to make the decision and then discover in the reaction where the spirit was really speaking. So I think some of that was happening today, uh, but it, that's the stuff of discernment. It's not what your head says, it's what goes on in the heart. And I think we see that on the plenary tracker, what you've been describing today, the same thing happened. Mm. And we have some really interesting comments coming through. Gerilyn says women are leading parishes all over the world. She's been in Peru where it's the women who are administering the sacraments and leading communities, especially in remote areas. She says, God help us. And um, Mary says, as a watcher tonight, thanks to those who stood again and pleaded to be heard. I feel proud of those standing in pain and taking their freedom to do so. Mm. Thank you. And uh, perhaps reflecting on the, the many dimensions of fear, Mary, Susan says, can I find out how my bishop voted? <laughs> yeah. It could well be some anxiety there. Um, Claire Condon, we did hear last night on the plenary tracker, heartfelt, despairing calls for inclusion from people who feel that the church is designed to specifically exclude anyone who is not ordained and or male. And we heard from Ben O oh, from the, the Rainbow Catholic Coalition, deep pain, deep, deep, deep despair and, and great sadness from the women who had been part of yesterday's deliberations. And certainly the exclusion from having decision-making power of any kind. Mm -hmm. Where does this development from the bishops take any hope of reform? I, I mean, I, I take Mary's point that, that perhaps in the reaction and the response and the reframing, but, but there's a newspaper headline tonight about this. The Sydney Morning Herald has just gone live describing this as a devastating blow. Hmm. And it is a devastating blow. Um, but I, I think what happened later today was exactly what Mary was saying. There was this sense of we can do this. And, and I, I know last night at dinner, I was talking to three women who, who were devastated. And they, they were saying how they felt. And I said, you, when you go home, you need to meet with your bishop and tell him. Mm. They need to hear face to face from, from people. Because I think sometimes they can get closeted away. Mm. And, um, they, and they don't hear this, you know, what it's really like. Mm. And I think, how will it be implemented? I think it will happen diocese by diocese. Mm. And I think some dioceses will move more quickly than others. There is a late motion, hopefully, that we'll get up, that we'll have a round table annually from various groups in the church to try and keep accountability going. Mark uh, Coughlin, you're wanting to yeah, hop in there? Yeah, sorry. No, I just wanted to respond to, to Mary. The, the other thing I, which gives me hope is there was a very clear message uh, that we're not, we're not watering this down. So it's not what what can we when we go back and redraft, um, it wasn't a matter of can we make this can we now make this palatable? Mm. Um, now I don't know where the discernment goes, but that yeah, I just want to make that clear that it that it yeah. And so I'm hopeful. But it's uh, not a backing off for a compromise. Yeah. It, no, it's, a, it is a deep it is a deep it is a deep listening. Mm. Um yeah, but but yeah, that there yeah, we we weren't People weren't saying, you know, that, that what can we do just to what can we do just to get a compromise? That wasn't mm -hmm. the message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kate Engelbrecht says on the Q and A, thanks to those who stood today. There are so many of us in chaplaincy roles and leadership roles who are shattered yet again by the clear evidence that the bishops do not want to support women in the ways that they pretend they want to. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Collo, your focus has been on formation, and yes. I think it is a significant matter in the context of exclusion and inclusion. Absolutely. You yeah. make a very strong point that formation should be for every last one of us, mm -hmm. but it's exclusively focused often on the ordained and, and it to is. a poor effect in the modern world. That's true. That's true. I mean, 
formation should be for all the people of God. But the institutional church puts all its money and resources into the formation, the education of a small group of celibate men. And the rest, it's up to them. There's no, no great financial resources going for the education of other men or women. Um, sometimes people look at the school system and say, oh, look at what the church is doing. That's wrong. That's what the religious orders have done. <laughs> it's the religious orders who began and enabled the school system to flourish. That was paid for by the hard work of the parents and the generosity of the men and women religious orders. It's, it's not a consequence of the uh, institutional churches as such. The other aspect of formation then is formation for priesthood. And I think that's showing signs of serious trouble. That was named in the uh, Royal Commission on the um, abuse of children. And Pope Francis has also named it in terms of the evil of clericalism. I call it the sin, but he called it the evil of clericalism when young men are formed into a male-only cult. That's not about servant leadership, not, not in terms of the community, but about privilege and power of the individual. And when I think about that, I don't think it's healthy to withdraw young men uh, from normal social and the cultural world around them, put them all together in a little enclave. They don't have to cook, they don't have to clean or launder. They don't have to work to earn money. They don't have to find their own accommodation. They don't have to negotiate multiple uh, types of relationships. And so when young men are cocooned away from these normal realities, is it any wonder if they feel special, privileged, ontologically different, I hate that term, when for six years, they've had this special privileged life. I think it'd be much better if they did their theology degree as other young men and women are doing their university courses out there in the community, uh, finding their own accommodation, looking after their own meals and engaged in spiritual direction, possibly working in a parish or volunteering in a Catholic agency, maybe only having one or two years towards the end of that time in immediate preparation. But um, this taking them away from the community that they're meant to be learning how to serve obviously isn't working, obviously isn't working. And I, I do have a, a comment in here from Jared Nolan, who says, I believe that until all the church members, especially the clergy, firmly understand that God is not male, Yes. <laughs> in our clergy leaders, we continue to see that males are to play out their roles as the head of the church. Mark Copeland, I did want to bring you in there for your response as a, as a man to this. Now, you, you said to us earlier, you stood with the women who were so angry and so distressed about this, but we are confronting what Tracy McEwen called last night functional misogyny, yes. uh, a, a, a system that is designed at every level to, to reinforce male authority in the church. And, and when we have women on altars in whatever capacity and women with deliberative votes, that is a, a powerful way to break down more than just those structures themselves, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and um, I, I, there were also there were also one or one or two bishops and there were also clergy who stood um, with, with, with the women today. Um, and yeah, I guess I it caught me, um, it caught me by surprise how much it affected me. Um, like there were plenty of tears from me as well, um, and I was thinking, where is that coming from? And I guess it's um, this is you know we, we this is my family, and there are members of my my church family who are hurting so, yeah, so badly. Um, yeah, we've just got to do better. Yeah, and and you know we've talked and this was mentioned um, we've talked a lot about the the two lungs of the east and west and, and the east mm -hmm. and right. but also we're not a full body at the moment in terms of, of you know only half of humanity 
uh, that that we we get the we get to share the gifts and yeah. So yeah. Craig Condon, I do want to I do want to take yourself take us to liturgy and sacramental life now. We didn't have the discussion today because of this this huge and, and dramatic episode in the in the council. But how does that idea of inclusiveness or lack of inclusion manifest itself in liturgy and sacramental life? And and you know what could the council conceivably do within that context? I think the first thing is our images of God mm. uh, it is so important. Uh, Not a bloke. Not actually a bloke. <laughs> It has implications for our identity, our spirituality, and our relationship with God. And, and I think once, once you get a sense of an inclusive image of God and inclusive language, your whole approach mm -hmm. to the liturgy and to sacramentality changes mm -hmm. because you include, you bring in others with you. And I, I think that's key. And there's, there's incredible resistance mm -hmm. in the translation into the English yes. to do that because I think uh, the clergy know the implications and they, they don't want to go there in a sense. Um, but as baptised people, we mm -hmm. share. We share in the, in the prophetic and the, mm -hmm. the royal role and the priestly role. And I think Pope Francis, in opening up the uh, acolyte and the um, lector. the lector roles in a country like ours, we say, well, people are already doing it, but to to make it, um, I guess, universal and to encourage that use uh, is a very small beginning. Yeah, and it's but such a it's such a powerful message, isn't it? And I I'm. You know, I have been for many long years a reader in Sacred Heart Kutamundra. And, you know, I'm all right at doing readings. I'm fairly okay after 15 years on ABC Radio as a morning's presenter. Um, and yet it was such a shock to discover that really my status within the church until very, very recently was, you know, a substitute effectively mm -hmm. in case a bloke turns up. But, Mary Colo, I'm wondering from you what meaningful change would be affected do you think by inclusive language, inclusive orientation, inclusive form formation, and what changes could actively be wrought if we if we were to be able to push this through? If we could really take seriously that God got it right in making humanity male and female, and that's what that's where we hear the words in the image of God they were made. No, not one. And, and then in the second Genesis story, uh, God looks at the Ha-Adam, the earthling creature, and says, it is not good for Ha-Adam to be alone. So uh, to realise God got it right. <laughs> uh, and then uh, John's Gospel says the word became flesh. It does not say the word became a man. It says the word became flesh. And if we would read our texts accurately read and, 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 yes, do study them. Come along, study them, but read them accurately. You know, people say if Jesus had wanted uh, women priests, he'd, he'd, he would have ordained them. I said, well, hang on. He didn't ordain any men either. <laughs> so there are no ordained men in the early church, and yet there's Eucharist. We know that there were women who were called deacons. I've seen a gravestone of a woman called a deacon, not a deaconess, a deacon. And she's in Jerusalem uh, around the year 320. Okay. She's called a second Phoebe. <laughs> so, you know, if, if we knew our scriptures, if we knew our church history better, and this is where because the lay people haven't had opportunities to do these studies. So they just take what's said from the pulpit and, and often it's wrong. It's wrong. And look, I've got a, a number of, of comments about language and, and, and liturgy. Uh, one saying it's not only bishops who need to support women's leadership within the church. Some ch church members work actively against this. Yes. And uh, this commenter says, I know this from experience 
as well as other times when church members worked in shared leadership with a woman designated leader, the later a great experience of the church in all aspects. Kath says, related to inclusive language, why are we still calling the priest father? And Tony makes an interesting comment, and perhaps Mark Copland, I'll throw this one to you. It seems that the language of prayers at the plenary council is in fact more inclusive and creative than the prayers that most people are exposed to at mass. So the, the, the formal structure of this within the council, I understand, has been quite inclusive and thoughtful and, and powerful. Absolutely. Um, just the... The liturgy committee, um, the, the the people organising it have yeah really um, yeah it's been it's been beautiful uh, the way it's it's um, touched you know in, into our our baptism um, into yeah it, it's just really touched into um, the body of Christ um, and there's been um, yeah liturgical actions uh, that people have taken each day I mean the way we um, sat with the, the crimes of, of abuse in uh, by clergy and church employees um, in a lament. Um, yeah, I've, I've found it very rich um, and, and people have, have fully engaged. So, yeah, you're right. Sadly, that's not always people's experience of, of liturgy, but certainly at the Plenary Council, that's been mine. Yeah, until, until we go to the, to the cathedral for Eucharist. Yeah. And then we go back to the old model a Vulcan celebrants in front, right. and it's all up there, and yeah. we're, the, we're the observers, we're not participants. That's right. I, um, I do have a comment about female acolytes, and I just wonder if any of you would like to, uh, during the plenary council, and, uh, and another one saying perhaps St Mary's Cathedral thinks that it's enough to have a statue of Mary Magdalene in the sanctuary. <laughs> Michael Dyer says, why are there no senior female servers at daily masses, let alone institute female acolytes and lectors? Um, Mary Colo, what are your thoughts? Well, I want to add preachers. <laughs> <laughs> so acolytes and that, fine. I would love to be able to be authorised, to be able to give a homily. I teach the, I teach, um, the seminarians the scripture. I've given workshops to young priests on how to give a homily, and yet I'm not allowed to give a homily. I don't want to be ordained to give a homily. I just want to be authorised. They don't have to ordain me, just authorise me. So, yeah, personally, I find the language of ordination problematic because it, it goes back to Roman society of moving up a class of, of leaving behind being a plebeian to being in the order of equities to being in the order of senators and so that term was borrowed straight from the culture of Rome it's got nothing to do with religion and so in moving up but notice moving up it was being called an ordination and that happened in the second century Tertullian blame Tertullian but it's 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 not good language because it does get that sense of a tiered church structure, just as the Roman society was a tiered Roman society. So maybe we could come up with a better word. Yes, and, and look, it's it's an absolute you're absolutely right, and that is the the lector was seen as the first step towards the diaconate and then towards the priesthood. Yes. But of course, that's nothing to do with how the early church functioned. The early church oh, was looking at sort of a hierarchical ladder for getting there that said women aren't allowed to stand up and even, even read. No. Uh, Kate Inglebrick says in the comments, like so many women in church leadership, um, oh, now it's, uh, this, this always happens to me, the, the comments that are fantastic start reading and then, then, then I, I lose them as I scroll through. Um, but, um, yeah, another question from Phil, Philippa McElroy and from Michael Howard. A couple of questions about the deliberative vote pattern. Uh, Philippa says, from the looks of the numbers, it looks like motion 4.5, not achieving a qualified majority, depended on just a few bishops' votes. Um, is that correct? <clears throat> and I think technically, yes. Michael says, could someone clarify the deliberative vote pattern? Um, Pachet 25, 58% of the total, Pachet juxta modem 10 or 23% and non Pachet 8 or 18.6%. So Mark Copland, that goes back to what you were explaining to us earlier about needing a two thirds majority 
But also there is this vote in the middle, which is yes, but with reservations, which has the effect of a no, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, and I get, I, and that was discussed today, the, the problems with that, because if we had that discernment uh, that's been spoken about, then if you, um, if it was yes with qualifications, uh, then you'd be able to actually talk about the qualifications. But once it gets to that point, and as happened, like that motion has now been voted down. So that motion won't come back again. They'll, they'll have to, we agreed today for a new motion. But that, yeah, so that there's a problem with that, with, with that um, mm. way of going. So if we actually look at what happened to 4.5 <clears throat> among the bishops, it's 25 yes, 10 yes, but with reservations, and eight no's. Mm. So in fact, with those 10 yes with reservations, the diversity of opinion that could have been expressed by yes, but with reservations, may well have been enough to get those those motions up to a majority. Yeah. And it was stated today that Pope Francis has removed that yes with reservation for the next synod, mm -hmm. but it's, it's incorporated into the statutes for this plenary council. And so it has created a lot of confusion. Mm. And Claire, in speaking about Pope Francis, he's also just enabled uh, lay people, men and women, to become head of dicasteries in the curia. Mm. So they don't have to, that type of governance right at the head of a curial uh, office does not have to be tied to ordination. Which uh, I, I do have a comment from Paul Collins who says, it seems that some of the bishops don't realise how Pope Francis's style recognises the politics of change depending on like-minded bishops that lead the change. If the Australian bishops gave a majority vote to women and the diaconate, it would free him up and support him to act with his Vatican colleagues on this issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just going back to Kate's comment. I started a moment ago before it flipped off my screen. Kate said, like so many women in church leadership, I lead in liturgical roles on a daily basis. My role as a chaplain demands it of me. Like so many others, I can't even imagine having to sit in a room where clergy and bishops talk about and vote on our suitability. Talk of deep listening makes me weep. We only need to raise our heads and see what women do. Enough listening. Time for action on this. Otherwise, it'll be a case of last one, turn off the lights. <laughs> I do want to go back to each of you and ask, given what we have discussed today, where do you think this council can land with regard to a more inclusive Australian church? Given the fact that perhaps this, this crisis is a, a fork in the road. Um, Claire Condon, I'll go to you first. I've been working on this for about 30 years. Yes, <laughs> some of us have been in the trenches a long time. <laughs> As I said before, I think it'll be it'll be step by step, and it'll be different in different uh, dioceses. In my paper, I raised the issue of I worked in Adelaide with Len Faulkner, where he, he governed his diocese um, with himself, his vicar general, a woman from the diocese and a woman from the religious order and it worked and the church didn't fall down and it worked very effectively, but it relied on equal participation and teamwork. And I, I think that kind of um, governance could emerge in some diocese or a, a version of it, uh, but I, I don't expect it to happen in every diocese at this stage. It'll be, um, it'll be patchy. Mary Carlo, to you and uh, on, on that, where, where we can actually viably land. And Veronica says in the comments, it seems the bishops are afraid of this. Yes. And, yeah. and what do panel members consider the source of that fear? Oh. Yeah. Uh, sexism, misogyny, a fear of women, uh, a formation that had them shut off from ordinary interactions with women. Uh, the fear of each other. Fear of each other, that's right. Yes, that's right, of, of being seen to be doing the right thing. And that's, that's a terrible thing. And it's very hard to face one's own fear. And until people can face their own fear that is driving them, uh, we're kept in boxes. I can keep myself in a box 
if I allow fear to dictate what I'm doing. But fear is never the sign of the spirit. Because I'm not present in the room at the plenary council, it, it's hard to see exactly or get a feel of how things can move. I can only rely on what I'm hearing tonight or rely on what I'm hearing in the blogs and do what I've been doing all week, praying like mad, praying like mad, you know, that the Holy Spirit will be alive and active. As a member of a religious order, I know we too call on the Spirit when we come together in chapters to guide our deliberations. And she works. <laughs> she <Yes>. works. <laughs> so I, I, I just hope and pray that she is working alive and well uh, in those deliberations. And those, I'm wearing her colours. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the colours of the suffragettes, that hasn't escaped me very well. <laughs> Michael Dyer says the fear brother bishops have of, of each other. Rosemary Lynch says, are they frightened of the Holy Spirit, in fact? And, and look, there's, there's also a point um, from Jeff Mulhern. He says two groups of disheartened people, one women and the other the LGBTQIA community. It's encouraging that women took a stand that hopefully brings about much needed change. Is it not equally important for the LGBTIQA plus community to take a stand supported by those ready to stand with them? Um, Mark Coffin, we're just on 8.15 and we're about to finish. But the, the point, of course, is that this is not about women versus men. It's not about one versus another. It's about the sisterhood and brotherhood of all of us. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All, all humanity. Um, and for me, one, one of the, the, the things that stays with me from today is an amazing young woman who looked around the room and there are lots of people with this coloured hair. And she said... Um, this is my this is my place for the next sixty years. So what you know what you do, what we do together um, matters. So yeah, I, I think um, yeah, I think it's really really we we can't walk away from this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, and I'll end with one last quote: "The spirit cannot be crushed, but it takes bold and brave women and men who stood up today." Thank you. We must continue. Yes pray. Look, thank you all for being with us this evening. You can also follow the Council's progress via several blogs. Francis Sullivan is writing his blog on the Catholic Social Services site. John Warhurst's blog can be found with Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn. Geraldine Duke is also following the process. Those links are all on their respective web pages and that of Garrett Publishing. Tomorrow night, we'll be joined by Virginia Burke to discuss governance, and we'll go to J Dr. Jackie Raymond and Dr. Trish Hindmarsh to talk about ecology. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you very much indeed. And I look forward to you tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you.